The topic for the ANU Solar Oration for 2020 is transitioning the world to 100% clean renewable energy uh, with a very important side topic, which is how the US election will affect the transition. And it's hosted by the ANU Energy Change Institute. So my name is um, Professor Andrew Blakers and I'm from the ANU College of Engineering and Computer Science and a member of the ANU Energy Change Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Please note that this is a public forum and the media may be present. So before we move to um, uh, Professor Jacobson, who's the main speaker, as is traditional, the ACT Minister for Climate Change and Sustainability, Shane Raffenbury, will provide his traditional short update on progress in Canberra towards zero emissions. So Shane, over to you. Uh, you have to un unmute, Shane. Thanks, Andrew. I'm the first person to do it in the call already. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. And hello, everyone. It's great to hear you, see you today, and I look forward to hearing Mark's presentation very shortly. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for that acknowledgement of the traditional custodians. Uh, and also to the ANU for hosting this event once again. It's a terrific opportunity each year. Uh, look, it has been a challenging year for a whole lot of reasons. Here in the ACT, of course, we started the year experiencing the bushfires. We've had the pandemic, but I'm pleased to be able to provide some good news today in the context of what 2020. Firstly, as I think many on the call will know, we have reached our 100% renewable electricity target here in the ACT, and we are now in powered entirely by zero emissions electricity. It is an important milestone that has attracted local investment and I think has also inspired other jurisdictions to act and to see what is possible. Uh, the second piece of good news, which is not fully public yet, but I'm pleased to share with you today, is that we have reduced the ACT's emissions by 40% below 1990 levels, which is our target. And we've achieved that in this financial year as was planned. Uh, this has been largely achieved through that move to renewable electricity. Uh, when, we sit, when we set that emissions reduction target back in 2010, to be honest, it wasn't clear exactly how we'd get there. But I think what we've done in setting that target and getting to it is demonstrate the importance of setting targets and then setting off an implementation pathway on to achieve those targets. And I think the same the federal government could learn from that process. Now, of course, we can't stop there and we still have much to do. Uh, firstly, let me talk about maintaining 100% renewable electricity. Uh, to maintain that target, we do need to deliver additional capacity. We need to continue to improve energy efficiency. And of course, we need to focus on energy storage. Uh, you may have seen that, of course, last uh, earlier this year, we ran another reverse auction and we secured through that an additional 200 megawatts of power, which is designed to meet the ACT's growing population uh, but also, as we have increased electrification of our system, we will need more power coming into the system. Uh, so we procured an additional 200 megawatts of wind energy and 60 megawatts of battery storage as part of that reverse auction. And those auctions were delivered at significantly lower prices than the previous auctions, uh, with an average pr price below $50 a megawatt hour for that wind capacity, which is about a third lower than previous auctions. But Despite that extra capacity being brought into the system, we still expect the overall cost of the scheme for ACT households to remain uh, below $4.90 per household per week. Uh, so I think that's a significant achievement. Uh, we'll also continue to roll out the next gen battery storage program for households and small businesses. And we're also looking at further ways to encourage battery storage, including the commitment announced during the election campaign to install a 250 megawatt big battery here in the ACT. Uh, energy efficiency remains important for maintaining our 100% renewable electricity supply in a cost effective way. And of course, it also helps households and businesses to reduce their energy costs and improve comfort. And we will place a greater focus on improving energy efficiency and shifting to all electric households, particularly in public housing and rental properties as part of the just transition. Uh, that idea that we need to, of course, make sure we look after our uh, lowest income households as we make the shift and through the parliamentary and governing agreement that's just been signed between ourselves and the Labor Party 
there is a commitment to enact minimum energy performance standards for all rental properties in the ACT in 2021. So to pass the legislation next year with a stage rollout over the next couple of years. Uh, and that's really important for you know, traditionally here in Canberra, rental housing stock has been the lowest quality stock in terms of energy efficiency and thermal comfort. In terms of meeting our next emissions reduction target, which is 2025, where we have a commitment to reduce emissions by uh, 60%, uh, two big challenges for us, that's transport and gas. Transport now makes up around 60% of our emissions and natural gas use or fossil fuel gas is around 20%. And so it's vital that we focus on cutting emissions in these sectors. Uh, to address transport, of course, that is a complex area in a car dominated city where most of our emissions do come from that private motor vehicle use. Uh, but we have committed to improving walking and cycling infrastructure, as well as introducing further measures to encourage the uptake of electric vehicles. And so we'll see a new policy to have free, regi free vehicle registration for two years for electric vehicles as soon as we can pass the regulations for that. And also we'll be installing 50 public charging stations across the city and offering interest-free loans up to $15,000 for the purchase of a new electric vehicle. Just towards the end of last term, I announced that the new hospital expansion at Canberra Hospital, the big new emergency department out there will be gas-free. It'll be an all-electric development. That's, we believe, the first of its kind in Australia and one of the first globally to do that. The new CIT at Woden will also be gas-free. We've now got several of our new schools that have been built in the ACT coming online as gas-free all-electric developments. So we're really starting to accelerate that move to have gas-free buildings and really have them roll out as all-electric. Of course, we're gonna to need to be doing some serious work through this term to think about grid reliability as part of that shift to all-electric. So look, that's a quick update on where we're up to in the ACT and some of the policies that are due to be rolled out as part of the new government. Uh, we've only been in place for a couple of weeks, but uh, certainly that's the direction we're heading in. A lot of that has been achieved by collaboration with groups such as the ANU, with ARENA, working with other jurisdictions and working with industry. And we look forward to that continued collaboration. So thanks again, Andrew, for the opportunity to update and I look forward to hearing Mark's comments. Well, thank you very much, Shane. It's uh, very encouraging as Canberra moves to zero emissions in 2045, is it? The current, yeah, 2045, if not before. So for the, the main speaker will be along in a moment and I'd like you to um, think of questions you might like to ask him in the Q&A session uh, a little later. And uh, if you look down the bottom of your screen, you can see a Q&A button that you can um, press and uh, lodge a written question. And we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. But um, if there are too many, then you'll be able to email questions to energy.change at anu.edu.au until Thursday, and we'll try and follow up. So the um, this 2020 solar or orator is Professor Mark Jacobson, who is Director of the Atmosphere Energy Program and Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford University. Professor Jacobson has a long and very distinguished career spanning several different fields and has been really quite influential in the United States around questions and around the world indeed, around questions of moving to uh, zero emissions energy systems. So Mark will speak for about 50 minutes and then we'll have about half an hour or so of um, questions from the audience. So Mark, over to you. Okay. Uh Thank you very much, Andrew. Let me just share my screen here and uh, get that started. Yes, we and, can see your screen. That's good. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for your kind introduction and invitation, Andrew. And also um, congratulations, Shane, on the success of the ACT. It's amazing to see uh, the, the region being 100% renewable electricity and going further to go to all energy. So I want to talk about um, roadmaps to transition cities, states, countries, and the world to 100% clean renewable energy, and also discuss uh, policies related to that, specifically uh, what's going on in the US in terms of policies, especially after the election that just finished. Um, so first of all, what's the problem? You know, Why do we care? Why do we want to transition? Well, from my point of view, I've always looked at this not only from a climate point of view, 
where global warming is expected to cost the world about 20 to $35 trillion per year by 2050, but also an air pollution and energy security point of view. Worldwide, 7 million people die from air pollution from fossil fuel and biofuel combustion. And that presently in terms of statistical cost of life costs about $30 trillion per year, even that's based on statistical cost of life. And fossil fuels are also scarce resource, limited resources, and they will become scarce over time. And that will eventually increase energy prices and economic, political, and social instability. So we really need to address this problem before it becomes serious on top of the other problems. And there are other energy insecurity issues as well, including reliance on uh, energy that you have to uh, tr transport long distances. Anyway, these are all drastic problems that require immediate solutions. So uh, this, well, so our idea has always been to electrify everything and provide, you know, well, electrify everything or provide direct heat and provide the electricity and heat with 100% clean renewable energy, namely wind and water and solar power. So by wind and water and solar, that's onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power at CSP, uh, geothermal electricity and heat, and also some solar heating as well as electricity, um, hydroelectric power, mostly existing hydroelectric power, and then small amounts of tidal wave power. And so those are the electricity options, but we'd electrify transportation with combination of battery electric vehicles for uh, passenger vehicles, most medium and light duty vehicles, uh, even uh, short distance aircraft, short distance ships, but for long distance heavy transport, like long distance ships and uh, planes and some long distance trucks and long distance trains, hydrogen fuel cells where the hydrogen is produced by electricity and then the hydrogen reproduces electricity in a fuel cell. And then for heating and cooling of buildings, uh, we'd use mostly electric heat pumps and some solar hot water preheating, some geothermal direct heat. Uh, we'd use for high density urban areas, some district heating and cooling. For industry, we would electrify that as well with pretty much existing technologies on a larger scale. So arc furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters. These are all existing technologies. And then all the electricity for uh, everything, including the hydrogen, which you, produce, you can produce by electrolysis from electricity, we provide with wind, water, and solar. So just some updates. Um, so, I mean, you all have seen wind turbines that extract kinetic energy from the wind and convert it to electricity. The nice thing about wind is it doesn't actually take much land on the ground because it's mostly space in between wind turbines. So you can use that for multiple purposes, such as farming and rangeland and cropland. Uh, but you might need a lot of them. Offshore wind, of course, there's no land required. And now there's floating offshore wind. And in fact, large floating offshore wind turbines are being uh, built and proposed right now. And this is great because that allows wind to be put far enough offshore that people don't have to see it. And it also allows wind in some locations like offshore California where the bathymetry is pretty deep. The water depth gets pretty deep pretty fast. In the US on the East Coast, it's pretty shallow out to about you know, three or 400 kilometers because during the last ice age, it was all land. But on the West Coast, it goes deep pretty fast. So it's, there are not too many places where you, you can put uh, you know, drill a turbine uh, tower right into the ground, into the ocean floor. But floating changes the whole game. And this really allows, this will really allow many countries to go to 100% renewable energy for all purposes. Uh, because there's just so much offshore wind available, including in Australia. For solar, uh, we all know have seen solar on rooftops and in utility scale solar farms, but solar is also growing over water now, uh, not only reservoirs, but some in the ocean uh, in some places where you can cordon off an area of the ocean uh, and make sure the waves aren't too heavy uh, over canals. So you can pretty much put solar any anywhere. The nice thing is solar can also go at, at high latitudes and by tilting and tracking the sun. In fact, most people don't know this, but the location worldwide where you have the most solar resource, if you had a PV panel that tracks the sun in the annual average is over the South Pole. You get partly because it's elevated, but you actually can track the sun perfectly 
um, part, well, at least three months of the year, there's 100% sunlight, but you're not gonna build transmission to the South Pole, but that's just a fun fact. But the point is, is that you really can put solar anywhere on earth and get some reasonable resource if you combine it with uh, either storage or other, or lots of wind, for example, to complement it seasonally or daily. Now for transportation, there's been a growth of electric vehicles and not only passenger vehicles, as we all know, but also trucks, buses, ships, and even aircraft. So here's an example on the left, a Tesla uh, semi truck, which goes 850 kilometers purely on batteries. On the right is a Nikola Trey semi hydrogen fuel cell truck that goes up to 1200 kilometers on hydrogen fuel cells. On the bottom left is an electric ferry, and on the bottom right is an electric bus. So they're on the order of a million electric buses already out there on the road in the world. Most of them are in China, but many countries, I'd, I'd say almost most countries probably have some electric buses by now. Now electric aircraft are starting to uh, take off, so to speak. Uh, on the left here is a nine seat battery electric aircraft that flew. On the right is a four seat hydrogen fuel cell aircraft. And we think that uh, heavy duty, like a 747 type aircraft, long distance, will have to be hydrogen fuel cell, uh, whereas short and medium distance will be electric and you might have some hybrids. But uh, I mean, you can transition everything, including military vehicles, uh, tanks and uh, armored vehicles, helicopters, uh, they can be either electric or hydrogen fuel cell. But again, the heavy stuff is mostly gonna be hydrogen because there's a certain tipping point at which you know, it's more efficient obviously to use electricity as much as you can, just batteries, battery electricity. But at some point, when you get heavy and long distance enough, you have to carry around too many batteries that that weighs in the favor of hydrogen. Uh, but uh, that might change depending on the technologies being developed. Okay, so for storage, uh, we're gonna need electricity storage, hot and cold storage, and hydrogen storage. So for electricity storage, there's concentrated solar power associated with storage, pumped hydroelectric, power with storage, uh, existing hydroelectric dams are basically big batteries, batteries themselves, flywheels, compressed air storage, and gravitational storage with solid masses. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, for heating and cooling, where there's water tanks for hot, hot water tanks and cold water tanks, boilers and chillers as they're known as. Uh, ice is a form of storage. And then there's underground uh, seasonal energy storage in boreholes, water pits, and aquifers. And I'll show you some examples of that in a second. And then building materials, another form of storage. And hydrogen is also a way to store, uh, store energy. Now, with regard to hydrogen, uh, we propose they're, they're used primarily, as I mentioned, for long distance heavy transport, not so much for electricity, except maybe in microgrids. And there are some applications where you would use them instead of batteries, but uh, in not non-microgrids, in microgrids, they can be used for both electricity and heat production. Uh, but otherwise, batteries are more efficient. So, but you can do an analysis every few years to see whether hydrogen uh, is, is competitive or better than batteries at some point for like gener electricity generation, but not right now for sure. Um, but batteries are, of all these technologies, the most expensive, but their cost is coming down really rapidly. And so you see huge battery and solar uh, hybrid plants going up, and even wind batteries uh, and solar hyd uh, hybrid plants. In Australia especially, you see several of these. And they're very effective. And because batteries can provide electricity instantaneously, even faster than natural gas, or especially uh, and faster than other types of peaking power, uh, they're really desirable if we can get their costs down uh, even more, then the game is pretty much over in terms of keeping the grid reliable. So let me just give some examples of some of these storage technologies. Uh, this is gravitational storage with solid masses, two examples. On the left, uh, well, if you have wind, excess wind, you can use it to power a motor to lift concrete blocks or rocks uh, like with these cranes. And then a motor runs in reverse as a generator as you lower the concrete blocks. So when you need electricity, you lower the concrete blocks. When you, when you have extra electricity, you lift them. And these are very efficient and ostensibly uh, very cost effective. They're similar to pumped hydropower in their efficiency. And it operates on the same principle because pumped hydro, basically when you have extra electricity, you pump water up a hill. When you need electricity, you let the water flow down a hill and run a 
go through a, a turbine to produce electricity uh, through a generator. Now these trains on the right, they are filled with either rocks or concrete and they run on the same principle. If you have extra electricity, you push the train up the hill and then you need electricity, let it uh, roll down the hill and run a generator. And so again, these are relatively efficient, over 80% efficient, uh, and they're starting to become commercialized. Now, these are boilers and chillers, as I uh, mentioned briefly, but this is in a, a district heating system. So my university, Stanford, in 2016, built a fourth generation district heating system. So there was actually a natural gas cogeneration plant right outside my office and that produced 80% of the campus electricity and heat. And that was replaced by these two chillers and a boiler and hundreds of kilometers of pipeline throughout the university to pipe hot and cold water to buildings. And the heat and the cold uh, are provided by electric heat pumps. And so then the electricity Stanford then bought or purchased uh, 120 megawatts of solar, put 10 megawatts on rooftops, and then two power plants, a 15, 60 megawatt solar power plant to offset the electricity. And so the second power plant is almost done. It'll be done in 2021. And when that's done, the campus will be 100% renewable, not only for electricity, but also heating and cooling. And so it replaced the entire natural gas plant and the system is very reliable. Uh, so this is district heating can be done, you know, lots of campuses and also in cities and high density areas, but it's very effective. Uh, here's another type of district heating system with underground borehole storage. This is in Okotoks, Canada. In 2004 and five, there are 52 homes that were built on the top left there. In the, on the garages, these solar collectors were put and the solar collectors contain a glycol solution. So in the summer, when the days are very long, that glycol solution absorbs heat. The solution is then piped to this building on the right where the heat is transferred to water. The water is then piped under ground under this field that under the field, uh, U-shaped holes were drilled and U-shaped pipes were put in. So that hot water, it goes down, it transfers the heat to the soil and then it comes up cold and it goes back in, a, in the loop. And that heat is stored in the soil for up to six months until winter when the snow is on the ground, like on the left, bottom left. And then the whole system is run in reverse and that heat from the soil provides 100% of the heating for these 52 homes. And while batteries cost on the order of 200 to 300 US dollars per kilowatt hour of, of electricity storage, the storage portion of this only costs less than a dollar a kilowatt hour for the heat storage, but it's thermal, not electricity. So it's very, it's actually inexpensive to run and it's very reliable, even though the efficiency is not great. It's only a like a 58% round trip efficiency of the sun coming in in the summer to the heat coming back in the winter, which is much less than batteries. Uh, it's so cheap, you can afford to waste some energy there. Uh, this is a similar seasonal district heating system. This is in Vogens, Denmark. And Denmark has several of these where there's a water pit and that like, looks like a swimming pool and it's filled with water. And these solar collectors during the summer mostly will heat the water. Uh, the water is then insulated on top with a covering and the water heats up to about 80 degrees Celsius. And during the winter especially, but all year, that hot water is used to heat about 2,300 homes. Uh, for the city. So it's a district heating system and, and these are more these should be more common because they, this one also is very inexpensive uh, relative to electricity storage, for example. Uh, another type of storage that most people are not familiar with is ice storage. Actually, my university since 1998 had a big ice cube under a building and at night when electricity price was low, uh, it was used to produce ice and then during the day, instead of running air conditioning, waters run through coils in the ice and sent to the buildings to cool the buildings. And so this is like battery storage because it avoids air conditioning demand in the afternoon, which runs on electricity. Uh, however, it costs about one tenth the battery costs per kilowatt hour of battery storage. So this is another cost effective way. These are used in stadiums and hospitals in a lot of places in the world. Uh, so let's then move to, well, can we transition an individual home? Because it really starts at the ground up. If we want to get 
rid of fossil fuels, we have to do it in our own lives as well. So I had the uh, lucky opportunity to be able to build my own home and it was completed in 2017. And when I built it, I made sure there's no gas going on the property and it's all electric, including the vehicles and tried to and efficient, energy efficient. So I put solar on the roof, of course, and it's about 13.6 kilowatts. There were uh, batteries in the garage. There are four batteries. It turned out my utility only let me turn on two, uh, which was fine because it turned out I only needed two and the other two were just sitting there uh, in backup mode and as if I needed in an emergency or if the other two go out. But um, so what happens is in the morning, sunlight hits the panels. The first thing that happens that the electricity goes to power home needs and then the next set, the remaining electricity goes to power the batteries in the morning. And then the remaining electricity goes back to the grid and is sold to the grid. So for heating, uh, air, and, air and heating and cooling, I have electric heat pumps. So they run on electricity. Uh, heat pumps are great because they don't, uh, they use one fourth the energy as natural gas heaters or even electric resistance heaters because they don't create heat or destroy it, they, they move heat. So they move it from the outside. So on the right is the outside unit where it extracts basically heat from the air and moves it inside to the inside unit. And in each room, there's an, one of these inside units on the left. And there are no ducts. That's why they're called ductless mini split electric heat pump air heaters and air conditioners because there are no ducts. Uh, there's uh, pipes, small rubber pipes between the outside units and each inside unit that are filled with coolant. And anyway, there's an, so it's heat is exchanged between the outside and the inside when you need air conditioning. You take cold, you suck cold out of the air. Of course, you can suck heat or cold out of the ground too, or out of water. Uh, where I live, it's the most efficient is just out of the air. Uh, but it uses, as I mentioned, one fourth the energy as a gas heater. Same with my water heater. It's a heat pump water heater. It extracts heat from the utility room that it sits in. And then that heat is transferred to the water. And the water heats, heats up just like any other water heater, but it uses one fourth the energy. So it's so efficient. And then there are LED light bulbs for cooking. I use an electric induction cooktop, which most people don't like electric resistance stoves because it's hard to control the temperature. They're not as good as gas, but these are better than gas. Uh, they boil water and half the time is gas. Uh, you can control the heating. It's even cooking throughout the pot. You do need either iron or stainless steel base pots, but those are not, not expensive at all. And the nice thing is the stove doesn't even feel hot when you touch it, even if you're boiling water, because electrons excite the molecules in the uh, pot itself, in the base of the pot, and the resistance creates the heat. So the pot gets hot but it only transfers heat to the stove by conduction. So it's a lot cooler than if you were actually heating the stove itself. So those are nice. Um, just to summarize three years of energy use over, and I also have two electric cars, uh, over three years I generated 120% of all my home and vehicle energy use. I had no electric bill, no natural gas bill or no gasoline bill. And I received $700 per year back from the community choice aggregation utility in California and also six other states, there are these CCAs that uh, will, if, well, if you don't have your own solar, they will procure 100% renewable electricity for you, which is nice. So that's if you're in an apartment complex and you have to pay an electricity bill, you can't put solar on your roof, then you can still opt in with this CCA to get 100% renewable electricity. But if you have solar, they actually pay you for that solar at the same rate that you would pay for it at the time of the day. So we have tiered rates. So there's the cheapest time right now for where I live is between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. So that's when I charge my cars. Uh, but in the peak time is between like 3 and 9 uh, p.m. Uh, and then there's another rate. So if I generate electricity between 3 and 9 p.m., they'll, they'll pay up to 28 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and that's, that's pretty good. And it adds up over time. So... So if I look at overall, these numbers below show what it typically costs uh, for a typical homeowner. So because the other thing I avoided, I did not have to pay a gas hookup fee. In my area, that would have been about $6,000. So I avoided that. I avoided gas pipes, which also would have been another five or 
I, and I said, I haven't paid no electric bill, gas bill, or vehicle fuel bill, and these are the ranges of their costs. So overall, uh, you'd expect, if you have a new house, to save at least four to $15,000 up front and three to $10,000 per year due to savings. And the payback time uh, without subsidy is about 10 years, with subsidies about five years. There are subsidies in the US uh, and in California for, uh, for uh, solar, for batteries, and even water, uh, heat pump water heaters. So with subsidies, it's a five-year payback time. The solar panels are warranted for 25 years. Uh, there's really no reason anybody who can't either change out their own, all their appliances to become electric uh, or change their vehicles, why they would not uh, benefit. With regard to cars, if somebody drives, in the US people drive a lot, uh, 15,000 miles per year for 15 years, uh, then they will save on the order of $20,000 in fuel cost uh, due to the price of gasoline around here. And that's a huge amount. So that's, that makes up the, any difference in the price of the car difference between electric and gasoline per car. So it's really becoming, and this is happening worldwide, it's becoming much more efficient to electrify everything. San Francisco just passed a law this last week where there'll be no new natural gas in new buildings our new residential buildings as of January 1st. And actually that's, San Francisco is not the first uh, city in California to do that. Uh, we also have Menlo Park and Berkeley, and I think a couple others have passed laws where there's no new natural gas in buildings. So we need that. We, we don't need natural gas in buildings. We don't need anything except for electricity. And a lot of that electricity in new buildings can be generated with rooftop solar. In fact, there's a law in California also at the beginning of this year where all new buildings have to be zero net energy. So it pretty much requires solar to be on rooftops for that to uh, happen. Um, I want to show one benefit of, of the, this home system. So on September 6th of this year was the hottest day of the year outside temperature. Sorry about my Fahrenheit units, but uh, it's 106 degrees Fahrenheit inside was 77 because I set the temperature inside to a range and that's the upper limit of the range. And so it's perfect temperature inside, but on the right, you can see the solar production, which is the green. Uh, the blue is the, uh, the blue is the consumption of electricity. During, well, where it overlaps the green is the consumption of electricity in the house or the charging of the batteries. And then after the sun goes down, the blue is the battery production of electricity. And then the red is grid electricity. But if you see on the top right in small print, it shows that during that day, I produced 60 kilowatt hours and I consumed 45 kilowatt hours. So on the, on the order of 15 kilowatt hour difference, more production than consumption. Uh, but this is the day where there are blackouts throughout California. And my point is if we go to 100% renewables and it, everybody and all the homes have heat pumps in them, which are so much more efficient, they hardly use any energy. Uh, that's a solution to solving this problem. The other reason there were blackouts in California was that, well, during the day, there's a lot of solar growth, and that's great for daytime production of electricity. But the wind growth in California has stalled. Uh, but if we actually look at, in fact, there's no offshore wind, but if we actually look at the offshore wind resource, which is shown here, uh, this shows the hour of the day and then the average for July on the top, and then there's January, October, and April, kind of the three on the bottom. But July is in the summer when you need electricity from wind. And one of the peaks is after the sun goes down. So if we actually grow offshore wind in California, which we expect to now that we have a new administration and offshore wind can become unleashed. And if we grow that and continue to grow solar, then we can get the, we can capture that peak in demand that occurs after sunset in during the summer, and that should have helped to avoid blackouts in the state. So the problem, some people claim, oh, it's renewables that have caused blackouts, but no, it's, it's not. It's not enough renewables. We need more solar and more wind, and particularly offshore wind, and then also more storage. And so that will solve the problem uh, for any blackouts that are occurring. And by the way, it, it should be pointed out uh, that, well, we have two nuclear reactors in California, Diablo Canyon, and over the last two months, one has been completely down uh, and the other was down for about half the period. One was scheduled maintenance, the other uh, was unscheduled maintenance. So those are not, and those are shutting down completely in a few years. Both of them will be shut down completely. Uh, but 
you know, so they they are also intermittent or because they're of the down not only the scheduled maintenance but also unscheduled maintenance and so it's not a question of we need more nuclear either uh, because they're not reliable and also expensive uh, very expensive and have other impacts so the next issue can we transition the entire world to 100 percent clean renewable energy for all purposes and so we did roadmaps for 143 countries including australia and the us and i'll just summarize the results and first i'll show you some results for all 143 countries put together uh, so the end use power demand in 2016 of all these countries was 12.6 trillion watts or terawatts and end use power demand is what people actually use and then if we go to 2050, it's projected that would go up to 20.3 terawatts in a business as usual or BAU case. Uh, but if we electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean, renewable wind, water and solar energy, that goes down to 8.7 terawatts or 57%. And these, there are five main reasons for this. 21.7 uh, percentage points of that reduction is due to the efficiency of battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles versus internal combustion engine vehicles. For example, uh, the if you have all the gasoline put in a vehicle, in a gasoline vehicle, only 17 to 20 percent of it goes to move the car and the rest is waste heat. Whereas in a battery electric vehicle, about 80 to 86 percent of the electricity that actually gets into the car goes to move the car and the rest is waste heat. So you actually reduce your energy requirements your end use energy requirements by electrifying vehicles. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are only maybe 30% efficient when you account for all the, all the efficiency losses, but they're still, they're still more efficient than battery electrics, not as good as hydrogen fuel cell, sorry, not as good as batteries for passenger vehicles. As I mentioned before, as it gets a you know, big heavy transport, then that equation shifts and those efficiencies change. But overall, if you average over everything, 21.7% reduction. 3.4% reduction of energy used by electrifying industry, 13% due to the efficiency of heat pumps. When you average over all energy sectors, using heat pumps will reduce all energy 13%. And then 12.1% of all energy worldwide is used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. So we would eliminate that in this wind, water, solar world. And then we think we can squeeze 6.6% .6 or so uh, end use energy efficiency improvements and reductions of energy use beyond business as usual. So that adds up to 57%. So here's a diagram showing kind of a similar thing. Well, the timeline of our proposed transition is 80% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So if we don't do anything, we go along the top line, which takes us to 2050 and you know, having a huge amount of huge power to make. But then by electrifying, we go down those five shades of colors down to the 100% line and that's what we need to provide. And then I show the distribution of the wind, solar, and geothermal and hydroelectric, especially. So we need 8.7 terawatts. So the proposed mix we have, uh, in the average over all countries, each country has a different mix, but this is an average over all countries. It's 30.5% onshore wind, 14.5% offshore wind, 11% residential rooftop PV, 14% commercial government rooftop PV, 19% PV power plants, 4% CSP power plants, 1% uh, geothermal, 5.7% hydro, and all of that exists in these roadmaps. We didn't add, actually add any new hydro. And then less than half a percent of tidal plus wave power. So you might ask, well, how much land does that take? And so this shows, well, tidal wave, there's no new land. Offshore wind, there's no new land. Uh, rooftop PV, there's no new land. We're, we don't have any new hydro, so there's no new land. Geothermal is pretty small. Uh, so it's all, all the land is utility PV plus CSP, which is about 0.17% of the world's land. And then onshore wind is about 0.48%, but that's all spacing, as I showed in that early photograph. You have a lot of space between those wind turbines that you can use that land for multiple purposes, including for putting uh, photovoltaics, utility scale PV on that land. But even if you don't, if you count that spacing, the wind land is spacing area, not footprint area. Even if you count it here, it's 0.65%. Uh, in the US, it's about 0.9%. It's about However, in the US, 1.3% of all the land right now is used for the fossil fuel industry, for millions of miles of pipelines, for uh, 
two point, I think it's, well, sorry, 1.7 million active oil and gas wells and 2.3 million inactive ones for coal mines, for storage facilities, for gas stations. The whole fossil fuel infrastructure takes more land than what we would need to power the entire US and indeed uh, the world. So we would reduce land requirements, we believe, uh, with a clean renewable energy system. Well, the next question is, well, can we keep the grid stable with just wind and water and solar? So we, we took these 143 countries and we divided them into 24 world regions and did a grid stability analysis in each region and indeed found that we can keep the grid stable by just accounting for and counting for the intermittency of wind and solar uh, every 30 seconds for three years in this case, and also accounting for all the storage options I discussed previously and using demand response and assuming inter, a well interconnected grid. And so this shows results for the United States uh, for all three years on the top for zero, day zero to day 1300 something, 1400 something. So, uh, and so what shows the blue is load, the load, the energy demand plus the changes in storage plus the losses uh, from storage, transmission, distribution, and shedding. And the red is the electricity and heat generation before losses. And if you look at the bottom graph, that just shows a 100 day period where this exact same comparison, uh, where you can see every hour the supply is matching the demand exactly. And we were able to match supply and demand everywhere, including Australia, including every region of the world we looked at. And then you might ask, well, okay, this is a perfectly interconnected grid. Well, what happens, uh, well, what happens if you discretize? Like we did Europe, for example, and we found we can, sit, uh, we can uh, solve the problem there as well. But then I thought, okay, let's look at each individual country, let's say in Europe, and let's say we tried to solve the problem for each independent country as if it's an island or a microgrid on its own. And then we looked at the cost of energy. So for example, Norway, the cost of energy per year, this is all energy. So this is electrifying everything, electricity, transportation, buildings, industry. It would be about 10.8 billion per year in 2050 for Norway alone. If you did Denmark alone, it's about 11 billion years per year uh, if they're in isolation. And, but you can do it. You can solve. We did Luxembourg and Gibraltar on their own as, it, as isolated microgrids. And, we, and if they provide their own electricity without any interconnection to the rest of Europe, they can, you can keep the grid stable there. But in, take this example. The total between the two is 21.8 billion years per year. Now, let's say we then combine those two countries and have, well, good interconnection between them. The overall cost gets reduced by 21% to 17.3 billion because we need... Uh, because one of the things you, when you have wind and solar that are intermittent, you often have to overbuild and you might, and you need a lot of batteries too, to when you don't have enough. But when you interconnect two countries, uh, you diversify the resources more, you have less overbuilding and less storage needed so you can reduce the cost. And so we've done this for multiple combinations of countries in Europe and continuously find that it's cheaper to interconnect. The more you interconnect, the cheaper it is. Uh, one more thing that we found that was interesting is the correlation between uh, heating load in buildings in cold areas, in cold countries in particular, and wind energy. Now, that might not apply so much in Australia, but especially in Northern Europe and Canada, in the US, in fact, in, in Russia. Uh, this just shows the, uh, over one year, uh, the, the black lines on the top graph are the heat load which peaks in the winter times, the beginning and the end of the year here. And the wind output, which also peaks, the wind output also peaks in the winter time. And then the bottom is just the correlation between the wind power output and the heating load for buildings. This is for the US. And there's actually a pretty strong correlation uh, between wind power availability and heat load. So this indicates that, you know, the more you build out wind, that's gonna help with your winter time heating demand if you have heat pumps. So we, these, are, these are just some uh, illustrations of what helps match power demand with supply on the grid, both well interconnections uh, in cold countries, building you know, wind energy out where there's a good correlation, et cetera. There are other things, other things as well at work. Okay, you might ask, what's the cost of energy uh, if we electrify everything around the world? So from all our 143 country roadmap uh, uh, plans, and the grid integration studies, we found that the world average cost of energy, elect electricity, if we electrify everything, is nine cents a kilowatt hour, but more important, the capital cost, $73 trillion up front. 
for the US, the capital cost is 7.8 trillion. Uh, Europe is about 6.2 trillion. But that's those are the costs of our Green New Deal. So the US Green New Deal that you've been hearing about is that would be the capital cost of transitioning everything. Uh, you've probably heard some numbers like it will cost $90 trillion. These are what uh, uh, some people were claiming it cost $90 trillion for this Green New Deal. But no, it's, it's only it's less than $9 trillion. Joe Biden, who is the president elect now, uh, he has committed to spend $2 trillion in four years on clean energy. And if he actually applies that to real clean energy and not uh, all of the above solutions, which would include things like carbon capture and biofuels and nuclear, if he avoids those and spends it on clean renewable energy, he's really getting to about one quarter of the Green New Deal in four years, which would be amazing. So that's, uh, I, I really hope that he steers that such funding if it actually comes through towards transitioning the infrastructure uh, to just clean renewable energy, because we can go a long way to actually solving the problem in a short period of time. Now let's look at these costs from just one other perspective. It's the annual cost of energy. Uh, in, a, in 2050, in a business as usual case, worldwide, the world would spend about $17.7 .7 trillion per year on energy. Now today it spends around the order of like 10 or $11 trillion per year. But the health costs will be about $30 trillion per year as it is now. And the climate costs would be on the order of $28 trillion per year. So that's a total of so the social cost, what we call the social cost of energy of 76 trillion. But because we reduce energy consumption 57% and the cost per unit energy goes down another 10% or so, we reduce the energy cost if we go to wind, water, solar by 61.4% down to $6.8 trillion per year. We eliminate the health and climate costs. So we eliminate the social cost of energy by 91%. So it's it's only a benefit to transition to clean renewable energy. We get rid of these, these horrendous health and climate costs and the energy costs go down because we're using a lot less energy because it's so much more efficient system. And there's a benefit in terms of the cost per unit energy. In fact, right now, new wind, new onshore wind and new utility scale solar are the cheapest forms of electricity in the US by far per kilowatt hour. They're on the order of a half the cost of natural gas. Uh, this is for the U.S. alone, the same thing. Um, wind, water, solar cost in the end would be about $770 billion per year, which is very similar to what the military budget is. So this is a feasible cost to actually transition uh, the United States and also the world. And we have the same number. We have numbers for Australia as well that show a very sim similar result. You get this huge energy cost reduction due to both the reduction of energy consumption that results in resulting from the efficiency and the cost per unit energy, and you eliminate health and climate costs. And so it's really a no brainer. In terms of jobs, we also create millions more jobs. In the US, it's about 3 million more long-term full-time jobs than lost. Uh, worldwide, it's about 28 uh, million more long-term full-time jobs than lost. And in Australia, there are you know, a lot of jo more jobs are produced than are lost. And these are permanent jobs, not just temporary jobs. And uh, let me just skip this one. This was uh, for metropolitan areas. So let me get to the policy. So, um, well, just let me start by just saying, so we, our first study on transitioning to renewable energy was in 2009 in this Scientific American article where Mark DeLuke and I um, did a study looking at, is it possible to just based on resources and looked a little bit at intermittency, but on materials, uh, to actually provide 100% of all energy worldwide for all purposes with just wind and water and solar? And the answer was yes, it's technically, technically and economically possible, even by 2030, it's technically possible, but for social and political reasons, it's more likely that it'll take longer to have a complete transition. And so we then suggested, well, we should try at least 80% by 2030 and then get 100% no later than 2050. Uh, little did we know that this paper turned out to be the scientific basis for the Green New Deal, which whose goal has been to go to 100% renewables uh, for all energy in the U.S. by 2030. Although, as we kept saying, it's like it's probably unlikely we'll get everything by 2030, but at least it's a it's a goal to shoot for. Uh, but we do think we can get everything at least by 2050, if not sooner. In certain sectors, you could get by 2030. It's just not all energy. Now, since then. There are 61 countries that have committed to 100% renewable electricity 
Now, keep in mind, electricity is not all energy. It's about 21, sorry, 20 percent of all end use energy. But still, it's a start. Most of these are smaller countries, uh, but it's important to have a goal and not to be outdone. Well, there are actually 11 countries that are already near or above 100 percent renewable electricity. Most of these are actually above 100 percent or at or above. So Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Uruguay, Tajikistan, Albania, Scotland, Kenya, Bhutan, Nepal, uh, all except two are dominated by hydropower. Uh, Scotland is mostly wind and well, as of the end of 2019, it was 92% renewables. And at the end of 2020, it'll be 100% renewable electricity in the annual average. Uh, Kenya is mostly geothermal, thermal, but also hydro and wind. So it's really encouraging that there are example countries that are there, even if it is with hydro, because a lot of people say it just can't be done, but this is just not true. It obviously can be done. In the US, um, just to give you some background of what's been going on over the last uh, at least five years, there actually have been resolutions and laws proposed in the US Congress. In 2015, there was a Senate Resolution 632 for the US to transition to 100% clean renewable energy by 2050. In, in 2017, a Senate bill and, and also a House bill. In 2017, another House bill. And 2019, another resolution. And then the Green New Deals deal uh, was proposed in 2019 in both the House and the Senate. So they were the seventh and eighth proposed laws. Now, ironically, none of these laws or resolutions has, has even been voted on, uh, but they have spurred a movement. Um, I should say that the very first one, the 2015 one, Resolution 540, actually was based on our, our uh, US roadmap. We did roadmaps for all 50 states in the US, and this really got um, attention of policymakers and was actually the platform of all three Democratic presidential candidates in 2016, and also the Democratic National Committee made it their platform. Uh, but it says, it said in the law, in the proposed resolution, it says, whereas a Stanford study concludes that the United States energy supply could be based entirely on renewable energy by the year 2050, you're using current technologies, the policies of the United States should support a transition to near zero greenhouse gas emissions, 100% clean renewable energy, infrastructure modernization and green jobs, et cetera. Anyway, that never got voted on, so can't be too happy. But um, there are, at the state level, though, a lot more has happened. There are actually 14 states and territories that do have laws on the books now that require 100% of all their electricity, not all energy, but their electricity, to be 100% renewables, and including Rhode Island, which is the most aggressive by 2030, Washington, D.C. by 2032, Connecticut, Hawaii, California, New Mexico, Washington State, New York, Puerto Rico, uh, Nevada, Maine, Wisconsin, Virginia, and New Jersey. Uh, so, but we do need all energy sectors, and that's really what the push needs to be, focus needs to be now, is to look at, you know, get to transportation, buildings, industry. Industry is probably going to be the hardest. There are 176 U.S. cities and counties that have uh, laws or some kinds of commitments to 100% renewable electricity, and some of them are all energy, but including many of the major cities in the U.S., Worldwide, there are about 300 cities that have committed to this. And there are several, and there are also counties and regions like, like ACT, as was mentioned earlier, is 100% renewable electricity. So that would be you know, in this kind of vein where not only a commitment, but actually having reached it. These, these cities haven't reached it yet. There are, there are about five in the US that have reached it, some small towns. Now, there are also about 260 companies to date that have committed to 100% renewables, including five, uh, eight out of the 10 biggest companies in the world, Google, Microsoft, Apple, JP Morgan Chase, Facebook, Amazon, Johnson & Johnson, and Bank of America. And uh, so, you know, this is a start. They're actually guiding, they're actually pushing investment in wind and solar farms around the world, these companies. And so this is really important. Not only can individuals help in their own homes, uh, but businesses can help, uh, policymakers can help by you know, passing aggressive uh, renewable laws, and, and and the general public can help by trying to you know pick the right policymakers. There are a lot of nonprofits that have committed to 100% renewables. Uh, so in 2011, I helped co-found a nonprofit called the Solutions Project, which uh, then you know was really the goal was to take these energy plans we were developing and and then engage the public and policymakers. 
and combine not only science, but business, culture, and community to, because nobody just listens to, to scientists uh, anymore, especially me, but they uh, do listen to entertainers and they do listen to uh, business people. And so having a coalition of people together actually is more effective at getting lots of these laws passed. So we created this movement effectively, not only um, in the solutions project, by, but getting a, a, a bunch of hundred percent, a bunch of nonprofits, NGOs together, there are at least a hundred nonprofits now to form a network of nonprofits that all had the same goal of going to hundred percent renewables. And as a result, that they were able to push laws. So, for example, the Sierra Club took the uh, took our plans for the states, and then went to all these cities. And because they have thousands of people across the U.S. who are on the ground in different states, and they went to the cities, and they were the ones. The Sierra Club were the ones who really initiated all these uh, laws in the cities to transition. So, but anyway, there are at least 100 nonprofits helping out in this uh, manner. Now the public is on board. Um, this was actually in 2017, a public opinion poll, 26,000 people in 13 countries. And what they found was that, well, 82% of people in all on average over all these countries want 100% renewable energy. What's surprising is only 66% of the people believed climate change was a global challenge. So why do more people believe in renewable energy than in climate change? Well, it's because uh, many people say that renewables make countries more energy independent, uh, they boost economic growth, they create jobs, they reduce yeah, reliance on foreign energy, so to speak, uh, and also in resiliency. So you know, people want to own their own power too. So the nice thing is uh, there are a lot of people who will believe in the solution even if they don't believe in the problem. So as long as they're uh, on board with the solution, that's good. Um, now, I want to talk, so that's, I just want to summarize here, but I also didn't want to talk a little bit more for just for a minute about what's going on now since the election. But let me just give you the summary. Um, these, job, these plans, we found that we can create 28 million more jobs and lost worldwide. We'd require only 0.17% of the land for footprint and 0.48% for spacing, avoid millions of air pollution deaths per year, slow than reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable throughout the world with 100% renewables. Uh, we reduce absolute energy costs by 60% and social costs by 90%. So we think these, there's really no reason why we sh wouldn't want to transition entirely to clean renewable energy. And here are um, some resources and uh, actually websites for the actual roadmaps and other stuff. But I'll just mention that, so we had this election and uh, uh, clearly Joe Biden has won and he'll be the next president of the United States, which is, is hopefully uh, most people are rejoicing around the world for that because, uh, well, in terms of energy, uh, certainly the last administration was stalling offshore wind in particular in the US, uh, but he was also promoting oil and gas and coal, even though coal has dropped, even under his administration, under the Trump administration, you know, coal was like 48% or so of the electric power mix when he started, or maybe it was 40% by then. Uh, but actually 20 years ago, it was like almost 60%. Now it's down to about 18%. So, you know, coal is nosediving in the U.S. And it's being replaced mostly by renewables, but also by some natural gas. So there is still some growth of gas. My concern with the new administration is mostly that he'll take up and all of the above policy. He'll definitely be better than Trump in terms of energy policy going towards renewables. But under the Obama administration, the Obama administration was had an all of the above policy where they would put a lot of money into carbon capture, into nuclear, into biofuels. Uh, but we have found over and over that these are not, some of them don't work like carbon capture. Uh, it doesn't decrease air pollution at all. If you need more energy, it actually increases air pollution. I mean, if you get your energy for the carbon capture equipment from fossil fuels, it increases air pollution. It doesn't decrease mining. Uh, the carbon, what do you do with it? Right now, it's only piped to oil fields to enhance oil recovery. Uh, you hardly reduce as much carbon as claimed. So it's always cheaper from a social cost and an energy cost point of view to just use money for carbon capture and just replace the coal or the gas. So this has been shown over and over again. Uh, so if you just waste, if we have a very, we have a very short time to transition 
And if we waste money, when I say short time, we need 80% by 2030. If we waste money on something and we can't, whereas we can deploy solar sometimes six months, up to six months to a year, some wind farms, like a wind farm in China is being put up in six months to a year now too. Um, so that we can deploy wind and solar very rapidly uh, and batteries as well. But if we spend money on things that are just in development and don't work now, um, even with nuclear, we know traditional nuclear takes between 10 and 19 years between planning and operation. So let's say 2035 for the next nuclear reactor, if it's planned today, that's just way, that's way past where we need 80% of the solution. So that's a waste of money we're, we're emitting for 15 years while we're waiting for that nuclear reactor to be put up. Even small modular reactors, they're trying to get money for that, but even the most advanced won't even be ready. Uh, to, they don't claim they'll be ready until about 2029 or 2030, but even then it'll probably be pushed off. And already the costs have increased substantially. And so it's just, we, we really need to focus, keep our eye on the ball and focus on technologies we know work. And so that's, you know, that's why I'd all urge you to just you know, focus on clean renewable energy, things that work and storage, demand response, efficiency, uh, and interconnecting with good transmission. So those are the things I would focus on. Um, I can share more, but I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions that'll bring up topics related to uh, the new administration, but um, so I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Mark. Perhaps if you could just stop sharing your screen now. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, questions that have come in and um, I guess probably the number one in many people's eyes is what if the Republicans own the Senate? Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's a possibility. So just to get everybody on the same page, the Senate right now is 50 to 48 in favor of the Republicans. There are two uh, seats in Georgia that are going up for a special election in January. And if the Democrats win that, they will, even though it's 50-50, they will control the Senate because the tiebreaker is the vice president, who's uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris. And uh, so that's a very important election. But if they don't win the Senate, then it's, it's not obviously not as good because if they do win the Senate, then they can really pass really aggressive legislation. Otherwise, um, Joe Biden as president can do a lot of stuff through executive order. Uh, they'll still get more done than under the current administration. Offshore wind will still go through because a lot of the stuff that's being stalled is through executive order right now, um, through Trump, and those will be reversed. And a lot of the Senate, even the Republicans, are in favor of renewables to a large degree, aside from Trump, because the, you know nine out of the ten windiest states in the U.S. are all quote red states or Republican-held states. And so they're making a lot of money from that. And there are a lot of jobs and, and money and solar is growing rapidly in many Republican states. So there is, uh, there is probably a, a big enough coalition, even if the Republicans control the Senate to grow renewables. Although it will definitely, if the Democrats control, it will grow even faster. But a lot, one more thing is a lot of what's going on right now is at the state level. And it's really the states that need to implement these things. And if the, if the states, States can do a lot on their own, even without the federal government. In fact, that's how we got those 14 laws that I talked about. Those are all states doing things on their own, uh, and even without, yeah, without the federal government under the Trump administration. So a lot can be done without even the federal government. Okay, so that, that really means that uh, it's somewhat similar to Australia, where you could have a hostile or an or a impotent federal government, but if the state governments are on side, then you can go ahead. Right. Yeah, that's true. And so, but I worry that then the states that are deep red states, you know, they won't transition as fast unless the federal government steps in because they're not going to, in their state legislatures, they won't do much more, even though they have benefit from renewables, they're not going to be as aggressive as many other states that um, are, you know, have more moderate or liberal leaning um, policymakers. So, yeah, so I think the definitely having the federal government will uh, be on, totally on board, 100% on board, will speed things up. It's not a deal breaker. Definitely the president is the most important person by far uh, in this transition right now. So there's a, uh, quite a few questions coming in. Um, so one question is how important is it, do you think that the Australian government and the US government for that matter commits to um, net zero emissions or is it fairly empty if there aren't uh, stepping stones along the way? 
Well, I think it's always good to have a commitment and to even if, you know, and a timeline to get to that commitment. So it really motivates people to get to you know, work harder. And even if that commitment can't be reached uh, in like in a known short term, it's still good to have the commitment to strive for something um, because without it, then yeah, everything's up in the air. You don't even, there's, there's no incentive at all uh, then to transition because it just, you know, you might find some people still sell gas if they can, or coal if, if they can find a market for it. So you first need a commitment, then you need kind of laws to strengthen that commitment and get to the end point. So I do think it's very important for the Australian government and the US government to have strong policies. Do you think the greenhouse gas emission uh, implications of refrigerants is important or do you think there'll be sufficient control to make sure that they do not escape in large quantity into the atmosphere? Yeah, well right now, uh, halogens are about 9% of global greenhouse gas warming. And so they're definitely important, and but their emissions have slowed down. So a lot of what's there, that nine percent is lot was emitted uh, years and decades ago. But there are still emissions of some uh, certain gases that are haven't been banned yet. So I think like everything else, that's so of all the emissions worldwide for greenhouse gas emissions, about seventy five percent are energy, and then about 25 percent are non energy, like uh, halogens. And then in terms of air pollution, about 90% of all emissions are from energy and about 10% are non-energy. But so you do need to control non-energy emissions as well. So it's not only the halogens, it's nitrous oxide for fertilizer, from fertilizers, it's methane from landfills and rice paddies and cattle and manure and it's biomass burning as well. So these all have to be controlled. So we want parallel efforts to control the energy and the non-energy emissions. So hydrogen for fuel cells to power aeroplanes and uh, long distance transport and the like is uh, obviously interesting and important. Um, how important do you think hydrogen will be for um, so-called green steel? Um, this is particularly important to Australia because Australia is the world's number one iron ore exporter from the Northwest, which also happens to have the world's best solar and wind pretty much. Um, as you could discuss that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so there is this hydrogen plant, I think it's in Sweden that, sorry, a steel plant that uh, runs off hydrogen, you can reduce the carbon emissions from steel, I think it's like 98.5% or maybe 99% per something percent with a hydrogen process. So yeah, that was that's an additional application I didn't mention that hydrogen can be used in and I think would be really useful uh, because steel right now is a big source of CO2, not only from the energy use in steel production, but also from the chemical reaction where CO2 is off-gassed. So both Australia and the US have uh, large areas of uh, excellent direct normal insulation and uh, so uh, CSP uh, concentrating solar power can obviously provide electricity although it hasn't made it into the market yet but what do you think the prospects are for CSP for direct um, integration with industry? Uh, um, I think I mean in, in theory it's great the idea would be to have a CSP plant and you have to but you have to have the um, industrial facility coupled to it pretty close by. So I think that's the disadvantage because I mean, most industry is already located somewhere and you can't just put a CSP plant anywhere and you can't pipe high temperature heat very far because you have big losses. So you really need the CSP plant next to the industrial facility. So I think yeah, there's probably more limited applications for that than, um, than using the CSP just to produce electricity and maybe, um, yeah, I mean, well, so it does work. It's just that I think there are limited applications due to the, you need the you need the industrial facility close by to the CSP. In your uh, 143 country analysis, uh, to what extent do the high voltage DC and AC power lines extend? Are they la long distance or are they relatively short distances? And we we assume between 1,200 to 2,000 kilometers for HVDC, and yeah, so we look at the costs of putting those up and also the energy losses through them. Um, but yeah, so for yeah, HVDC is beneficial over, I think it's about past 600 kilometers or so, then you want HVDC lines below the AC lines, HVAC lines. Um, but yeah, so that'll be really helpful for interconnecting places with strong solar or wind resources with places that use those resources. Uh, so, you know, you'll have to do it a step-by-step step, um, 
yeah, in Australia, you'll have a lot of potential for HVDC uh, because of the big distances and the big resources in different areas. So in the United States, it'd be very obvious to connect Texas, for example, with uh, New York and uh, California. Uh, what are the, you know, technically it's straightforward, what about the social issues? Right, so that's unlikely to happen because, well, first of all, Texas is its own grid and then East Coast, and there's an Eastern grid and a Western grid and then a Texas grid. But even the idea, yeah, the, the theory is because in the Great Plains, you have a huge amount of wind, for example, and the idea would be take that wind and wheel it to the East Coast. However, it's much better just to take the wind from offshore the East Coast and wheel it to New York City. So it's much shorter distance. The problem with transmission is getting it is not the cost even, I mean, it is expensive, but it's not, that's not the major issue or the, um, or the technical issue, it's, it's the getting the zoning. There are a lot of barriers to zoning it, to getting rights of way. And so you can, if you have existing pathways, that's probably best to piggyback on those existing pathways, but it's, you're probably not going to get uh, long distance transmission over you know, half the US uh, just because of the zoning problems and it'll take a long time. It's, it's better to use, well, the, cho the options are, the choices are to use local production and more storage and short distance transmission or uh, or a production that's farther away and more transmission and less storage. I think this local production and storage is gonna win that battle just because it's, um, it's just so difficult to get transmission sited over such a large distance. So with large amounts of local generation from rooftops, perhaps coupled with uh, local storage in um, car batteries, uh, does that significantly reduce the transmission and distribution losses? Oh yeah, yeah, that's the other benefit of rooftop solar is there's much less transmission distribution loss. Well, more, more not so much distribution loss. Well, it is because it's, if you're using it in your own home, there's, there's virtually zero loss. So that's the benefit. Um, and so again, there's the trade-off is utility solar and transmission over a shorter long distance versus rooftop solar and no transition. Now, utility solar is, is actually cheaper than rooftop solar just because the economies of scale. Now, I, should, I say that when you have an individual residential rooftop, but it turns out if you have a community of, let's say, 10 homes, that becomes cheaper than one home times 10. If you have like an industrial building, that becomes even cheaper or a, a community. So if you can install lots of solar on roofs simultaneously, that becomes cheaper. It starts approaching utility scale PV. But utility scale PV is still cheaper. It's just that it requires transmission and losses. So it really depends on the location. You're going to have a combination of both utility PV and residential rooftop PV and commercial and government. So it'll, you'll definitely need a mix because you, even if you covered all the buildings, let's say in Australia or the US, you, that's not enough electricity to provide all the energy you need for everything. So you do need other sort. You need utility scale. You need wind, uh, hydropower. It's in Tasmania and uh, yeah even geothermal. So it's, a mix is better. Do you see any um, raw material availability problems with wind, solar, batteries, and the other components of a 100% renewable solution? Well, we've analyzed materials, and when last time we did, I mean, there's about seven times more neodymium, for example, which is used in permanent magnets and wind, tur wind turbine generators, about seven times more than if you power the entire world alone with wind. So there's plenty of neodymium. Uh, for solar, there are a lot of elements that are needed for specific cells, but there's so many options of cells these days. If one is short, then you can use a different one. Lithium for batteries, there's enough lithium for, I think it was like five uh, billion cars in the world. There are close to a billion or more cars right now, but hopefully we'll never get even close to five billion cars. But so there are enough resources, I think. It's, but we want to recycle as much as we can. We want to conserve, make things as efficient. We want the goal is to eliminate as much as possible environmental damage, and so that um, which to that end, like there is a mining company for in Texas, for example, that they're building a mine, a rare earths mine, that's going to be run on 100% renewable electricity. So that that's like a step forward in the mining industry. And at the other end, uh, do you think there's going to be significant problems with um, demolishing and recycling uh, wind and solar generators at the end of their life? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of wind dread generators, they will last 30, 40 years. Actually, Altamont Pass, which is the three California wind farms are the oldest in the world. The farms are all from 1980 around. 
and many of their turbines are still there. So they just build bigger turbines next to the smaller ones. So there will be, of course, you'll decommission turbines and they'll have to be scrapped. And hopefully as many materials as possible will be recycled. Um, yeah, but it's, but you know, the thing is we compare wind, let's say to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels in the US, there are 50,000 new oil and gas wells drilled every year. And there are, as I mentioned, 1.7 million active oil and gas wells and 2.3 million inactive ones. So you have to do that continuously forever, 50,000 new ones every year. Where in addition to building the facilities and retiring the facilities, so you have materials, you just have a lot more mining and waste from the fossil fuel industry. We go to wind, yeah, every 30 years you have to, or 30 or 40 years, you have to recycle a wind turbine or um, that's just so much less orders of magnitude, less waste than all the cement that you put in. Like all these oil wells, these fracked gas wells, for example, they put cement casings in and then they fill them with cement afterwards when they're done. And so there's a lot of waste resource going right there just in these cement casings. I mean, Pennsylvania alone has like close to a million fracked oil and gas wells and they put a bunch of cement to, and they, and they still leak after, they're, after they've been filled, some of them do. And so, you know, we're talking orders of magnitude greater waste in the current fossil fuel industry than what would ever happen in a clean renewable energy world. So given that um, uh, President-elect Biden will assume office on the 20th of uh, January, um, what do you, th and the COP is, uh, the next COP meeting is in uh, November next year, a uh, year away, what is your view of how the politics of climate change and renewables will go during, say, 2021? Uh, worldwide or in the US? Uh, US and then worldwide. Um, I think, well, I think most people are on board with solving the problem. Even Republicans, a you know, larger fraction of them are uh, on board in solving the problem. But also, even if they don't believe in the problem, they do believe, as I mentioned, in the solutions in renewable energy. So I think, you know, it's just cheaper. It's making money for a lot of people and creating jobs. Uh, so hopefully it'll just, it won't be a partisan issue. But that's my goal is like the next couple of years that it won't be a partisan issue. It'll just be naturally everybody will want to do it uh, because it's benefiting everybody. It's just like a vaccine. I mean, everybody wants a vaccine to work. So uh, I think before, you know, it'll be shifting more towards, well, Republicans tend to like nuclear more, you know, or some other solution or carbon capture because it protects the fossil fuel industry. So that's, that's my biggest concern is they're going to try to, you know, push these, uh, what I call solutions that don't actually do anything helpful uh, because, but they'll claim that that's climate uh, benefit, benefiting climate. And that's my concern about, you know, kind of giving credence to these all of the above policies that allow uh, technologies that don't actually have much benefit or cause more pollution or, or take forever to put up. Um, my concern is that they'll latch onto that and claim that's climate beneficial and it's not really. Um, worldwide, I think the world is already, if it kind of their mind is more set about the solutions. Um, although, you know, a lot of countries have done, have done a lot and then other countries haven't done so much. So we have to really translate talk into action everywhere. And so even countries that you know say they're for it, they really have to step up and start putting laws down to actually transition. Um, so I am hopeful that we can transition uh, because uh, the technologies are there, the costs have come down, not only for generation, but storage, electric vehicles, uh, appliances, and demand response is starting to catch on. And uh, yeah, there's just a lot going in the right direction. Um, but there's, you know, there is a lot of, there are a lot of vested interests still there that will slow it down or try to, you know, divert the, divert funding, things like that. Do you think that um, the, the uh, President Biden, together with the current leadership of China and the European Union and Japan, which have a large fraction of the world's economy, uh, in 2021 will decide that they need to seriously work together to put long-term solution in place? Yeah, I th well, I, I'm sure they'll have meetings to that effect. And hopefully it'll be more than just, you know, agreements without actually actual laws being put in place in each country uh, and targets being met. We, I mean, we need, it has to be aggressive. As I mentioned, 80% by 2030, that is a, that's all sectors and all energy and also non-energy to avoid 1.5 degrees global warming. 
We need 80% by 2030 and 100% before 2050. To get that, we need a really aggressive action. So, you know, the Paris Climate Accord was, you know, it's a step, but it's not nearly so aggressive as we need to solve the problem. So I think it's, it really has to be incumbent upon all the leaders, including uh, President-elect Biden, that we need a rapid transition. We can only focus on technologies that we know work and can be deployed quickly. I think that's a real key part of it. And we have to transition not only electricity, but all the other sectors, transportation, buildings, industry. So there, it's just, it's, there are a few things that just need to be focused on. And if we focus, if these leaders focus on those things and really make aggressive efforts, we can go a long way. If they, if they come up and we'll say, we'll just try everything, we'll do an all of the above policy, we're gonna go nowhere. So focusing on California, which is I think the world's 20th biggest economy, if it was a country in its own right. Um, what are California's uh, climate goals and uh, is there an appetite to accelerate what, are, what they are? Yeah, well, California um, actually has a, well, has a law to go to 100% renewable electricity by 2045 and 70% by 2030. But it's already at, if you include, including hydro and wind and solar and geothermal, it's already at 55% renewable electricity. So I think it'll be at 100%. I mean, I'll, I'll be at 70% probably by 2026, 2027, 100% maybe by 2030. It does have a buildings law to get all new buildings have to be zero net energy, but it has to retrofit existing buildings. Uh, there's a lot big EV adoption. Uh, well, there is an executive order from Governor Brown, who is no longer the governor, but he did issue an executive order that there, California has to be zero carbon. I think it was by, I don't know if it was 2050. So there is something in place, but you know, that's, that was just a goal and as opposed to we, we need specific laws in place to get there. So there is, I mean, California generally has really aggressive laws and, and it is working pretty hard. I actually think it will, and because, I mean, we're not putting in new gas. We're re taking out existing gas, replacing them with solar and batteries uh, and vehicle growth, as I mentioned, is growing really fast. Uh, so I think it will be a, an example for the world, uh, at least for the U.S., uh, you know, within five years, it'll something will be closer to 100%. So there's a, been a lot of discussion of hydrogen, um, but as everyone knows, it's not easy to uh, handle hydrogen. And do you think ammonia or some or some artificial hydrocarbon will be the main hydrogen vector? Um, so I'm not a fan of ammonia because if it gets into the air, it's an air pollutant. In fact, in the Los Angeles smog, ammonium nitrate is the biggest visibility reducer in the entire Los Angeles basin. The ammonia from fat cattle feedlots in Chino, for example, they mix with nitrate from vehicle exhaust. So any leaked ammonia is an air pollutant. So I don't, I try to stay away from ammonia. Uh, so hydrogen, I think hydrogen can be, you know, if, if hydrogen burns, the flame shoots straight up. It's actually, a, in terms of, like, if you have a car that's hydrogen versus a car that's gasoline, the, car, the gasoline car will explode, the hydrogen car, the flame will shoot straight up and everybody in the car will be safe. So, so it's actually, a, I think, a safer fuel. It does have, it's more flammable, but if there are, you know, it's not like the Hindenburg, which everybody thinks about <laughs> anymore, which wasn't uh, burned by hydrogen, but by the, by the actual blimp burning up, catching on fire. Um, so I'm not so concerned about the safety issues because, you know, we're talking about hydrogen aircraft and, you know, there's not so much of a concern. I mean, there's a concern, but it's, it's not, it can be overcome with sufficient testing. So in Australia, there's a, a large amount of discussion about Australia being a renewable energy superpower exporting um, hydrogen based chemicals all around the world and becoming the next Saudi Arabia, so to speak. Um, what do you think the prospects are for significant transport of energy in the form of a hydrogen or an energy rich uh, molecule? Um, I mean, transporting the hydrogen to somewhere else or using hydrogen for transport? Uh, using, uh, transporting the hydrogen or energy rich chemical to another place for, for Japan, for example. Um, I mean, I, I would guess it's probably more efficient to produce the hydrogen in Japan than like I was debated, like if you have wind, is it better to produce the hydrogen locally and then ship it to a city for vehicles, to a filling station, or to transmit the electricity and then produce the hydrogen at, with an electrolyzer at, on site without having to transmit it? And I think 
you can do all sorts of analyses. In fact, there have been analyses done. Um, but in terms of simplicity, I think it's transmitting the electricity is simpler and then producing hydrogen on site is better. But, you know, there, I haven't looked at every scenario. So this scenario where you know, Australia would produce huge amounts of hydrogen and ship it, it might be efficient, but uh, you'd have to, I think you'd have to do an analysis to look at, well, is it better to do the, produce, the, produce the hydrogen in Japan itself, for example? Because um, they have, you know, they have an abundance of offshore wind too. And especially like, yeah, but if you use offshore, if you just build a huge amount of offshore wind and whenever you have too much wind to use it to produce hydrogen, that's a local source. You don't need to ship it. So uh, I would, I would my, my first inclination is that's probably better, but I, I think you'd have to do an analysis to actually show one way or the other. And there are places where you maybe can't produce it very well. It's more expensive to produce it. So. So are there any, apart from you know, alleged visual impact of offshore wind, are there any significant downsides of offshore wind? Um, well, all wind turbines will slow the winds locally. Uh, we have looked at that issue, and if we power the whole world with about 40% wind, you know, the, um, the wind speeds would be show, slowed by a negligible percent. You know, if you cover the entire world with wind, like every wind turbine everywhere, every over the ocean, over land, you can reduce the wind speeds 50%. But, you know, we need about 2.3 million five megawatt turbines to power the world pretty much, or 40% of the world. Um, maybe it was more, maybe it was 2.5 million. But, you know, that was a, it was a small reduction of the wind speeds. Locally, you do have a bigger reduction. So, sure, you have a local impact but you also have a local impact of buildings, skyscrapers will slow the winds. Um, like there's, in China, there's this thing called disappearing wind syndrome where you have meteorological stations downwind of these cities that expand and suddenly the winds go down. So yeah, things do affect the weather like wind turbines. So that would be, whether it's good or bad, it depends. I mean, if you're in a hurricane, you'd rather have a bunch of wind turbines there extracting energy. <laughs> and so, so that's an idea where if you have big arrays of offshore wind turbines, you can reduce severe storms and hurricane damage. So that's a benefit, but um, you know, in, in Texas, there, there, you know, there's the Great Plains was the Dust Bowl area, and so big winds would kick up lots of dust. And so once these big wind farms in West Texas came up, then farmers liked it because it was reducing these dust events uh, significantly. But bad things. I mean, people do complain about bird deaths, but I would argue that in winter turbines do kill birds. In the U.S., it's about 500 to six or 700,000 birds a year. But you know, communication towers kill 10 to 50 million birds in the U.S. Buildings are about a billion birds. Cats are about 3 billion birds a year. So it's pretty small in comparison to other sources of bird deaths. And fossil fuel energy itself is about 10 times more birds per kilowatt hour, coal and gas, due to the, uh, the wind because of the devastation of the land and the habitat of the birds because of the air pollution and because of the buildings that the birds will run into. So it's, I think, I think the most visible thing with wind is, or that people can complain about is the, is the bird deaths, including raptors too, um, which is another issue. But again, I think we need to look at, at everything in perspective and overall by transitioning, we would reduce bird deaths, we'd reduce wildlife deaths, we'd reduce 7 million air pollution deaths to the humans per year. So I think that counts for a lot. So as a final question, are you optimistic, pessimistic, or somewhere in between for the next, uh, for say the 2020s to put us well on track to uh, zero emissions? Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic um, because we have the technologies, costs are coming down, people are on board, most people are on board. There are still people in the way, but I think there's so much momentum and there's a big growth, even during this pandemic, while fossil fuel energy consumption and use dropped and, and building dropped construction, uh, we, uh, renewables have actually stayed constant or grown. And so that's a positive step as well. And, you know, records are being broken all the time and we have countries that are getting closer to fully renewable and regions and cities. And so I'm optimistic uh, and 
more because I know it can be done. It's you know, whether it will be done. It really depends on policy and individual actions. But knowing it can be done is important because if you're skeptical that it might not be done, not be possible technically or economically, uh, then that's I think a self-fulfilling prophecy, and it won't happen. And you'll head, you'll hedge your bets and invest in something else. But if you believe in it. Uh, then I think if people believe in it, then they will invest in it and pass policies for more of it. Well, thank you very much, Mark. That has been a fantastic uh, hour and a half. And um, if you wouldn't mind just staying on the website while I, I, I say goodbye to everybody. So everybody, thanks for joining us today. And we recommend that you check out the Energy Change Institute's website or subscribe to our newsletter for future updates. Uh, don't forget that on the 3rd of December, on Thursday, at 12 o'clock, the uh, Energy Change Institute will host Energy Update 2020, focusing on the World Energy Outlook 2020 from the International Energy Agency, which uh, seemed to have um, had a, a revolution in that they declared that solar PV was now the cheapest form of energy in history, which of course those in the, in the industry have known for quite a few years, but um, the International Energy Agency has suddenly discovered this to be true. So we hope we, you can join us all then and I wish you all uh, goodbye and have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you.